Hello, and welcome to my talk on safe, responsible, and ethical AI. My name is Tariq Rashid, and I just want to say thank you to the organizers for organizing a fantastic conference. A little a bit about myself. Um, I moved to Cornwall a couple of years ago. I run the Algorithmic Art Meetup in London and Cornwall. I run the Data Science Cornwall Meetup, the Coda Dojo Cornwall for children, and I have a business which helps organizations assess the risks around machine learning and AI and helps them mitigate those risks. So in this beginner-friendly talk um, today, we're going to be answering seven or eight basic questions. What is AI? What is machine learning in plain English? Why do we treat it so differently? What's so special about it? Um, can we can we explore some scenarios um, to illustrate those issues? And I think doing that with real-world examples helps us understand those issues much more than just abstract conversation. We'll be looking at some of the most common failures. Um, hopefully we can take those away with us and not repeat them. Um, we'll also be looking at this persistent question of the black box problem because it crops up often, so it's worth looking at. Um, and we'll also be looking at this question of ethics, which, if we're not careful, can descend into sort of a philosophical rabbit hole, so we'll try to avoid that. Um, we'll also be looking at the state of the art in terms of how do we answer these questions? You know, what are the methods for assessing these risks and dealing with them? Are there frameworks out there? What's the regulatory environment like? And we'll finish with um, a takeaway of, you know, just the three things if to take away if that's all you're going to do. So what is artificial intelligence and machine learning? Well, we should start with um, uh, this pair of questions. So on the left, the question says, can you locate people in the photo? And on the right, we're being asked to sum, add up these rather large numbers. Now, computers are designed to be able to do that arithmetic task. Humans find it boring. We're error prone to it. It's not fun for us. We're not really designed to do that, but it's exactly what computers are designed to do. Whereas computers find tasks like counting the number of people in a photo really difficult. The, the, the description of the problem is not, is not clear. And it seems that it requires a, something about human intelligence that computers don't have. Um, however, the task of, you know, the historical task of artificial intelligence is to try to get computers to do the kinds of tasks that we thought required human intelligence. And that's a noble task. Um, if we can succeed in some ways, then it, then it makes, you know, our own jobs much easier. And historically, AI research has looked at nature to be inspired um, by how it does um, its own sort of cognition. If we look at uh, pigeons or snails or worms, they appear to have rather small brains um, with not many neurons. And yet, despite that, they can do sophisticated things like eat, fly, navigate, learn to learn. They're also quite resilient to damage. Now, those are really interesting properties so there's something about the way they think, the way their brains work, that we can learn from, because we're paying for expensive kit that overheats and costs a lot, um, whereas a, a pigeon has a tiny brain of 0.4 grams and is able to fly. <laughs> um, and learning from um, how nature does it has inspired um, techniques in machine learning in, 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 in our kind of attempts to recreate that intelligence. And the idea of neurons connected to each other, working together, is what inspired the origins of neural networks. Quick look at some terminology. Machine learning is the process of training a model, whether it's a neural network, whether it's, um, you know, a flowchart or a decision tree or some other kind of model of how we think the world works. So training that is in machine learning and we train it with data. The word AI is uh, misused. It has multiple meanings. It has connotations around sort of science fiction. And I think in this context, in, in a business context, it's really useful to think of it as the whole system which makes decisions. 
AI is everywhere. Your smartphone um, uses quite sophisticated um, techniques to, to be able to answer your questions. You can often talk to your own smartphone. Um, Google announced um, not too long ago that they've been able to train a computer to play the game of Go, which is a more sophisticated game than chess. It's a much more open game. Developing strategies is much more difficult. And we thought we were decades away from that. So why are we treating um, AI so differently? Well, the first um, um, factor is that how it works is really complex. Um, it's fairly mathematical and that is a barrier. So if people generally don't understand how something works, then we need to take more care in, in its use and in applying it. The second factor is that often machine learning systems give us answers which are useful, but we don't really know why they give us those answers. So we might have a system that looks at faces and decides, you know, whether it's, um, I don't know, male or female or criminal or not criminal. Um, we, you know, we, we can't often ask, well, why is it? Why did you decide that? Why, why, what's the explanation? And that's a real challenge. Um, we, you know, of course, there's an explanation in terms of ones and zeros, um, in terms of values that flow through these uh, systems. But actually, in terms of an explanation that is meaningful to us, um, often that's not possible. And that that can be a significant barrier. And that's different from, say, how an engine works you know, in a car or how a kettle works. We, we can explain why steam comes out of a kettle. We can explain why a car goes forward when we press the gas. And these systems are increasingly being deployed and replacing uh, humans. So they're starting to make decisions that we previously would have hoped or expected humans to make. We would have trusted humans to make. So if we combine what we've just said, we've got things that are hard to understand, whose decisions are hard to explain or impossible to explain, they're starting to make decisions about us that we would hope or expect a real person was making. They're being deployed at ever larger scale. And some of those decisions are life affecting. So that's a, that's, 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 you know, that's a summary of, of why we care and why we, why we treat um, AI with this particular attention. Let's look at some scenarios. So Amazon was in the news for trialing um, um, a recruitment system which uh, used um, AI to help decide uh, whether you were going to get the job or not. Now, there were lots of um, challenges around that, uh, lots of pushback, uh, lots of valid questions around, well, how did you train it? Um, you know, if you're watching me um, doing the interview, um, are my facial features, are my nervous tics, are they being used against me? Um, maybe if I'm using the wrong lighting, um, maybe if I'm a particular shape or a colour or I have a particular hairstyle, will that affect me? And the fact that there weren't clear answers to those questions is cause for alarm. Um, you don't want to be denied a job for reasons that you can't understand, particularly if those reasons are not good. Um, Amazon also had um, an, another internal system which looked at job applications um, and it was found that their system was favouring a particular demographic um, which reflected their previous kind of bias, as it were, towards a particular kind of employee. So they had actually trained their system to repeat historical bias. So that there's a lesson there. We've seen in the news um, um, reports of um, police deploying facial recognition systems, often without our knowledge, actually. Um, and that's that's a that's a question there about why why we weren't told, um, why there wasn't a general kind of uh, awareness of that. But even more troubling was um, the uh, news that actually those systems were terribly performing. Although this is a picture of China, these statistics are from the UK. Um, one police force had a 98% um, failure rate for spotting criminals. 
And that's concerning because, you know, to what extent are people being targeted and inconvenienced or affected based on very perf poorly performing facial recognition systems? Um, you know, the, f the fact that we aren't aware, the fact that um, the these experiments were not more public, um, the fact that there was no, there wasn't more openness about their performance um, is, 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 is a problem. And it was only investigative journalism that, that uncovered this. Um, I think there's questions of trust. Um, there's questions of, well, would the public be more understanding if the police were more open that what they were doing was an experiment, um, a test um, to see how good these systems were, rather than um, trying to avoid um, publicity and 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 perhaps accidentally or or you know for other reasons deploying systems that had high high rates of um, failure, and that's separate from the question of um, privacy. <laughs> More recently, um, the Home Office was in the news for um, a U-turn on its um, visa. Um, system where it was reported that the algorithm that they had developed, uh, which was using traditional machine learning techniques, um, was biasing against um, people of a particular um, origin. And the error, um, the kind of the failing really was training the algorithm with data of previous. Um, visa decisions and those historic decisions were biased and therefore the algorithm learned to replicate that historic bias and that's um, a very kind of common um, failing in in machine learning and it's something we should kind of be watching for you know um, as the first thing uh, when we when we look at these systems um, you can't have missed the um, hoo-ha about the A-level algorithm. <laughs> uh, and there were lots of um, discussions in the media, uh, quite healthy discussions around, well, what is an algorithm? You know, how was it trained? Um, do we blame the algorithm, as some people were trying to do, um, the mutant algorithm? Um, or do we actually focus on those who are responsible and accountable for that algorithm and of course, that's the right answer. An algorithm is just software. It's not a living thing that can that can be blamed, that can can be responsible. It's a, a team of people developed it. Somebody should have tested it. Somebody is accountable for how it behaves, and that accountability always rests with a person. And that's a really important point that we shouldn't forget. Interesting um, aspect of this is um, a a design feature which wanted to preserve um, the relative ranking of schools and of course the discussion was well that means no matter how well you do in a poorly performing school you can't have good grades and that's you know that that kind of discussion should have been had um as the algorithm was being developed and tested, and you know, is that a is that a human choice? Is that a deliberate choice? Is that a political choice? Um, and this is where we get into questions of ethics, which we'll come back to later. We can't ignore social media. I mean, it's um, those big platforms are using machine learning and AI techniques, um, you know, extensively, and this is just um, a snapshot of the top performing Facebook posts. I think it's from July. And you can see for yourself that um, there is a particular flavor to, to those. We are well versed in the discussion around social media um, polarizing or biasing. Um, and then we ask questions around the business model of those organizations. Um, is it in their interest to, to kind of feed off and monetize this kind of division? Um, do they, do they actually essentially profit from from division and hate, and that's a very uh, deep question, a very valid question around an organization's ethics. Very recently, um, an organization called OpenAI released um, a language model which 
got lots and lots of people very excited um, because it appeared to be magic. You know, it's able to do some really astonishing things. Um, you know, it's able to kind of write letters and uh, even write computer code. <laughs> uh, and it really is quite spectacular. Um, the thing has 175 billion parameters. <laughs> um, so it's, it's certainly huge and a real landmark in, in AI research. But actually, it's been trained on human written communication, which itself is full of um, uh, controversial and um, unpalatable and and not very nice things. So it learns those. You know, it hasn't been um, designed to ignore those. Um, and there is lots of hype, and it might lead some to use this language model in their own products because it appears to be, you know, almost um, science fiction like in its ability to interact with humans. Um, but if you're not careful, um, you'll be using a system which um, is really rather um, uh, uncouth. Um, look at these examples. Um, I won't um, necessarily read out all the horrible words or the kind of, you know, the, the bias against um, genders or people of a particular um, kind of background. Uh, so you have to be really quite careful and understand what it is um, these these systems have have been trained on and whether they're replaying um, some of that historical bias. So it's useful to summarize um, um, you know having looked at lots of failures, um, some of the key ones um, so that we when we go forward don't don't repeat them. Um, so the, the biggest one really is um, training your systems, on data which which embeds within it um, historic bias because then you're training your system to replay that and you don't want to do that um, that's that's the kind of the top thing to watch out for the other common failure is training your systems on a very narrow experience a narrow set of data and when those systems then hit the real world and see more diverse scenarios they 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 they, they fail um, the other big thing that we keep seeing is organizations not testing. It's uh, amazing. <laughs> um, they, they get excited um, that they've trained something, but then they don't test it on, as I say, kind of diverse scenarios, but they don't continue to test. They don't, um, they should be the first ones to spot that their systems are going wrong before humans are starting to be affected by them. And this discipline we've seen, you know, in other sectors of, of tech, you know, continuous testing, diverse testing. We often also see um, poor accountability where an organization is not really clear on who's responsible for what. Um, it's not really clear on how to respond to um, a customer or a citizen that's, you know, asking uh, why a certain decision has been uh, achieved is asking that the decision is reviewed because they, they believe it is wrong. Um, when things clearly have gone wrong and perhaps, you know, it's hit the media or, or you end up in court, <laughs> um, that, that kind of governance, um, is shown up not to be kind of adequate. Um, so I think that's really worth thinking about in your own organizations is who's accountable and do they know what they need to be, what needs to happen to satisfy themselves that the systems you're developing are safe, well-tested and don't cause harm. And many organizations fail to be more transparent about what they're doing. We talked about the police earlier. Um, we talked about private organizations and organizations can be more transparent without, you know, disadvantaging their kind of commercial IPR position. And the great thing about transparency is that's the only way to genuinely gain trust. How can we trust you if you, we don't understand what you're doing with our data? Um, being open also means that you know, your customers are more understanding if you're still developing and testing. They're more willing to help you get it right. The black box problem um, is a really strong challenge to the use of machine learning and AI. And it goes back to that question of um, 
you know, lack of explainability. Would you take uh, medical advice um, or a recommendation to take medicine if the person or robot or AI system was not able to explain why they were recommending that? That's um, that's um, uh, an interesting um, challenge. If the impact of getting it wrong is serious, you know, if people can be hurt or, or killed, um, does that mean we should not use black boxes? Now, black boxes, unfortunately, can be really effective. Um, we can train them to give good answers to a very high level of accuracy or coverage or performance. So in some sense, they perform really well, in some scenarios, better than humans. But the fact that we can't get an explanation for how they work, does that mean we should ban them? Does that mean we shouldn't use them? So this is a question that is often raised, and there's lots of good debate about it. And I think, you know, I think a sensible take on this is to look at other industries which also have a black box. Um, we can look at, say, medicine and, and, and pharmaceuticals. And, you know, when we look into it, we realise that we don't always understand how some drugs work. We know they do. Um, we don't always understand why in some people they cause side effects. The the you know the the system is not deterministic, not one hundred percent deterministic. So does that mean we shouldn't use those medicines? What happens in those much more mature sectors? Well, what happens is that a lot of testing is done to ensure that we are sufficiently satisfied about a, a drug safety. And the question then becomes, what's the right level of testing that satisfies us as to a system safety, rather than, we don't really know the mechanisms by which it works, therefore we're not going to use it. The same um, parallel exists in information security. You know, information security is, is not fully deterministic. We can't always predict how things go wrong. So we put in place testing, we we try to map out as much of the problem as we can, we put in mitigations, we put in controls, we try to put in measures which spot things going wrong. And overall, we can be satisfied that a system can be safe enough. And that's the thinking I think we should be applying to this black box challenge. So let's let's turn to um, this question of ethics. So you can read um, lots of you know um, papers and books on 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 sort of an academic approach to ethics, and you know argue all kinds of interesting questions around whether you know a a a, a machine has moral capacity and uh, and so on. Um, but that's not practically helpful when we're trying to develop an application today. So let's let's kind of look at an example again to, to bring these things to the surface. So we've got um, here um, an insurance system which has been trained on on lots of data about about customers and their behaviour and characteristics like age or skin colour. Now, should we be using um, skin colour in making a decision about giving or denying insurance? Does it need um, um, a philosophical debate? I think most people, hopefully everyone, would agree that that's not part of the calculation. So we can design our AI systems, our machine learning systems, not to look at certain characteristics which we think shouldn't be part of that decision-making process. As a society, we've decided that's inappropriate, no matter what the data is telling us. And let's look at gender. Um, it is another protected characteristic, but imagine the data um, is telling us that, let's say, for example, maybe women are less aggressive car drivers and get into less accidents. Should we be um, using that? Um, is that fair? Should we actually be treating individuals as individuals um, and not as a gender? So if the data allows us to make more profit, 
but in doing so, we are using a characteristic like gender. Um, is that a, a good thing to do? And that's more of a gray area. Um, and you'll find organizations perhaps are using that as a part of their calculation. So this is a choice that we make. So the point here is that different organizations will make choices and they shouldn't pretend that there is a neutral, mathematical, unbiased approach to this. An organization's own beliefs, values, experience, flaws are encoded into the systems that they build and design. And one organization will have a different view of how society should be and may decide that actually we should be gender blind. And another organization may, may not. Um, and I think the healthiest approach there is for organizations to be honest and say, this is what we've done, be open and transparent. And if they're not open and transparent about that, that raises more, more challenging questions about why not. Um, and it's a chance for, you know, the public, your customers to feed back to you and say, well, actually, we, we're not happy with that. Um, and it may make you think in ways that you haven't thought before. It may improve you as an organization. You know, test, test, um, test dummies, um, in cars where we're all big men. Um, and it was only when, when, when that was raised and that was more of a, uh, a public issue, um, that, you know, some, some change happened there. So, you know, a motto for myself is design AI for the society we want to be, not to replicate and replay how it was. So we've asked lots of questions um, and we've raised lots of um, potential problems and risks. Um, how, do we, how do we go about fixing them? How do we go about assessing them? Well, actually, it's a fairly new field. Um, um, governments um, and public bodies are starting to um, consult um, published frameworks that they want feedback on. Um, so we're at the start of that journey in, in all honesty. Um, the Alan Turing Institute in the UK um, has done a lot of work around this. Um, the EU has done a lot of work around this. You know, huge bodies like the NHS have, are very active in, in this field as well. Um, I would recommend looking at the EU guidelines because they're short, they're clear, there's a logic to them based on values and what we feel should be preserved in a democratic society. Um, and starting from those values, uh, it builds up to a set of um, themes and questions for us to organise our our analysis of, of our own machine learning systems or somebody else's. The good news is that um, looking across the globe at um, different countries' approaches to um, assessing AI risk, um, there's a lot of commonality um, there's a lot of consensus, um, and actually the EU um, guidelines really summarise that consensus. Um, you can see here several themes around accountability, um, technical robustness and safety, pri respect for privacy, transparency, so that the public or your customers can understand and truly trust what you're doing, um, diversity and non-discrimination, watching out for bias against particular groups, um, looking beyond your own um, particular sort of, you know, product and, and understanding are there societal impacts from what you're doing? You know, is your product um, perhaps polarizing society? Is it, um, is it incentivizing the wrong things? Um, as, as we know that some, some social media systems do. Um, there's a really interesting one at the top here around human agency and oversight. And what that means is they, that we shouldn't be making um, systems that make decisions that affect people without a human having oversight and an ability to intervene and overturn a decision. So ultimately, a human is in charge other organizations have um, developed different approaches. Um, as I say, this is a growing and developing field. Um, I like this one, which, um, which we've developed, um, which starts from, again, values that we feel are important and, and what we want to preserve in our AI systems. 
privacy, equality, transparency, accountability, and there might be others, so you might you might have different ones yourselves. And applying them to part of your business, so applying them to your data. Um, is there, um, you know, how do we apply the principle of privacy to, to data? Does your processing of data de-anonymize what people thought was anonymous data? Um, asking questions like, are we transparent about the data that we hold and how we process it? Looking at your technology and algorithms, if your technology and algorithms are not open, if you yourselves don't know how your software works, well, that's the problem. Um, you know, you can't, there's a limit to how much you can trust your, um, your software if it's proprietary and making decisions. So open source is a really important principle here. Um, looking at your processes, you know, how are you developing and iterating your systems? Do you have an audit trail to justify why your systems are behaving the way they are? If you end up in court, can you convince uh, a jury that you had a, a, a good process for developing and refining your, your machine learning? You know, why did you tweak those parameters? What data did you test it on? Um, how were you satisfied that it was ready to go live? Um, and we've talked about governance, um, you know, an organization's readiness to accept responsibility for how its machine learning systems behave and to be able to respond, you know, in a timely way to subjects, you know, citizens or customers who raise concerns or raise a complaint. Um, and being accessible, you know, too many organizations, that isn't accessible. So it, you become, you know, a tyranny where you're making decisions that affect people, but those people can't have recourse. And that's that's not what you want to do. Um, so you can apply all of these principles, these values to those business domains. And that's how you develop and earn trust. You know, you can't just turn it on. It has to be um, developed by the way you behave and the way you operate. So the the kind of the honest picture here is that um, unlike civil engineering or pharmaceuticals or information security, um, our assurance, um, our understanding of how to assess AI and its safety is um, still in its early days. Um, but the good news is that um, there's lots of consensus on what good looks like. So I think we'll be accelerating up this curve fairly rapidly. Um, we'll also be seeing, I think, um, improvements to existing regulations. So GDPR is the broad governing regulation, the law. Um, but within it, um, you know, when it was in, developed and designed, it didn't, it didn't foresee this huge explosion in the use of data and, and machine learning and automated decision making. And Article 22 is, is, is the one that everyone discusses because it's the one that talks about um, subjects um, not ha not having um, automated decisions about them in a way that has um, a legal or significant effect. Now, you'll find um, legal professionals who will argue both ways about whether, you know, the meaning of this, whether you're allowed to do it or not, whether you're allowed to uh, profile people, whether you're allowed to make automated decisions or not. You know, one reading of this is that you can't. Another reading of it is that you can because you're not having a legal effect or you can if you gain consent. Um, another reading of this is that actually these articles aren't mandatory, that other parts of the legislation are. Um, so there's, there's the, the one thing that we can agree on is that um, the, the, the legislation needs to be tightened up and modernized. And uh, I think that will be happening, particularly as um, we, we don't want to squash innovation we want to enable it, but enable it safely. You know, that, that's what we all want to do. I think um, it's a uh, it's an interesting <laughs> um, um, analysis that you know, unlike other sectors where we have quite um, well established scales for assessing, you know, how wrong things have gone. Um, this is from the nuclear sector. We have a nuclear event scale, so it's a common language um, for describing. Um, levels of severity. You'll have that in information security. You'll have that in medicine. Um, but we don't have that in, in, in AI. And I think that's quite telling of how mature we are or are not. 
So to conclude, if you only take three things away from this talk, um, it's the understanding that, you know, if you feed bad data to your AI systems, your, you know, your machine learning is going to be learning uh, garbage. It's going to be learning, um, either biased data or narrow view of the world. Um, so garbage in, garbage out. That's the most um, important lesson, I think. Um, in order to gain confidence in your, in your systems, you need to be testing widely in diverse scenarios and continuously, meaning that you should be spotting when your systems start failing before your customers do. So testing is number two. And number three, I think, you know, for everyone, whether you're developing these things or not, or whether you're just uh, an interested um, active citizen, it's, this, it's, it's the point that, you know, don't, don't fall for the hype. Um, yes, there are complexities around machine learning and AI, but ultimately, ultimately it's just, it's just a tool. It's just software. And you should ask the same questions you would of any other tool, whether it's a hammer or a, or a drug uh, or a bridge, you know, why is it safe? Who designed it? In what scenarios was it tested? Does it affect some groups better than others? These are all questions you should be asking and not lose sight of the fact that a human is accountable for how these systems behave. Thank you very much. Um, I'll hang around um, on the call for um, for for answering questions and discussion, uh, but I hope you've um, enjoyed that and I hope it's been a useful introduction to the main questions around um, the safety, fairness and ethics of AI. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Tariq. It was very, very interesting and a great, great insight to the human mind and how we use it with technology. So yeah, a huge round of applause to you back there. Um, I'm going to leave the you know, the session open for you to take questions. Um, so it's completely up to you. You can answer them in person or you can do them in the chat. So whatever suits you best. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll stay in this room if people can hear me. Um, and if people want to talk, I don't know, I can't hear anyone, but if anyone wants to ask questions, I'll stay around for sort of five, 10 minutes. Um, yeah, so you can answer them. If anyone wants to ask you any questions, just put them into the chat and then yeah. Tariq can answer them. Yeah, I'll, so I'll, I'll stay online for five, 10 minutes Fab. for as long as people need me to. <laughs> we'll see you around. Thank you very much for your session. Thank you. Hi, Andy, I'll just uh, send a, a link here. Um, I'll go and find it now. AI guidelines. And actually, um, if you lose this particular link, um, you can always Google the words EU AI guidelines. But here is the link as well. It's pretty well indexed by all the search engines because it's um, referenced quite a lot. It's quite popular. Yeah. And just on that point about um, uh, official guidelines and frameworks, um, I've spent too much time over the last few months uh, reading through um, quite a lot of them. And um, it's a real issue, actually, that uh, organizations um, publish things that are just unreadable. And the, and the risk there is that, that people won't use them, people won't understand them, people will turn away from the subject. And if our collective aim is to get more people doing more of the good practice and making great things with machine learning and AI, because the possibilities are there, um, but if they're, you know, we want them to do them in a safe way uh, and therefore everyone has the maximum benefit. But if the guidelines are written in a way that's using language which is inaccessible, if they're 300 pages, organizations are busy. Um, they don't employ, you know, experts in that language. Um, so it's really important for guidance to, to be accessible, short, designed around the user. Uh, and we've seen this in other fields as well, like information security. You know, um, I, I worked, um, in central government and you know for years you know the, the guidance was impenetrable dispersed and it creates an industry where you know dark the dark arts of security <laughs> uh, but if you make the effort to simplify it to give confidence that they have all the information that they need and they're not missing any um, and it's designed around their uses you know people start using it and then then everybody's happy because then you can start working in ways which are better but also safe um, there's a question from Simon. Uh, yeah, it's good. the question is, it's a nascent field, and am I optimistic, uh, or is it too early to tell? Um, I think it's one of those things where 
the crucial factor is public opinion. So we know it's an important thing to do. Um, and there are lots of very relevant parallels with say information security where, you know, we know organizations don't do it well. Uh, we hear sometimes about um, breaches and failures in the news. Um, and then sometimes the public is concerned and upset. Um, but often, you know, these things are reported in and it's abstract and it kind of goes over, um, you know, and it's lost in the news cycle. Um, so I think the crucial factor is, you know, do do the public care? And for those of us, you know, in this community and other communities who understand the issues, it's part of our duty really to, to help the public become aware. Um, so I think, um, you know, given the response to things like the A-level algorithm and and, and and the fact that, you know, it's very newsworthy to put other similar things in the news, for example, the Apple credit card, um, Amazon's use of machine learning to, to do recruitment, people do seem to be latching onto it. So I'm optimistic that uh, people will start caring because it's, it affects them. Um, but I still think we all have a, a role in raising kind of public understanding and awareness. It is, yeah. I mean, um, you know, that's right. And, and this is why I think the public should be um, demanding uh, more transparency. I think this is where the you know, the role of um, regulation comes in. So, um, you know, do we as a society, as as a as a as as an, as an electorate, uh, feel that companies shouldn't be able to hide um, a bad or bad behaviour or or kind of uh, uncarefully designed algorithms? Uh, that affect people um, and you know the argument can be made that it stifles innovation it creates cost uh, but as a society we've already decided that information security has to meet certain standards um, healthcare products have to meet certain standards um, there has to be a minimum level of quality around financial products um, so I, I think that's the direction we're heading in anyway um, it'll be you know we'll be seeing um, Many of the countries in the in, in in Europe, the U.S., Canada, more Canada, um, we've seen the people have seen the benefits of the GDPR um, and their ability to hold organisations to account. So I think that's the direction we're heading in. Um, and you know, if we as a UK don't do it and everyone else does, people will become aware of that differential, and that'd be hard to maintain. Um, your question was around how can we look inside the black box, and and I think um, you know that that you know that we didn't really dig too much into it in this in this talk, but at a broad level, the the the, the, the question with the black box is should we use um, systems which give us answers, make make recommendations, which are um, apparently very successful you know, either 100% successful or 90% successful, good enough that we, you know, somebody wants to put them into into use. But um, if asked, why did this system recommend that I take this medicine? Or why did it say that I have this particular disease or that this person should be followed by a police van? Um, things that affect people. Um, if we can't give an explanation in terms that we all understand, um, should we not be using those things? And 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 I think you know there are people who argue that you know if there's no explainability in in high level terms, uh, because there is always explainability in ones and zeros. You know that there's ones and zeros is how those machines work. Um, but if you can't explain um, at a high level why uh, a particular decision was arrived at, um, some will argue that we shouldn't be using them. But others will say, um, and I'm of that kind of school of thought to say. There are lots of sectors where we have black boxes and we've as a you know collectively we've we've found ways to assure ourselves that those things are safe enough and that might be through diverse testing it might be through continuous testing um, we've designed assurance frameworks around medicine around dangerous tools around sort of buildings and you know, civil engineering building bridges none of these things are 100 percent deterministic but we've agreed that actually a certain level of inspection testing um you know the, the ingredients that go into those things that meet a certain standard um then we can be satisfied and i think i think i think we can do that this question around 
we've been taking the advice of experts. <laughs> no, that's not good enough. Um, <laughs> um, and I think you know, the general message for for everyone, for the general public, is you know don't let anyone displace accountability and responsibility to an algorithm. Um, you, we've seen in the news recently um, various high-profile people trying to do that, um, and and people fall for it because. There is an aura of mystery, of obscurity. You know, the science fiction element doesn't help. But at the end of the day, these things are still software. These still the things are decision-making recipes which somebody has designed, somebody has given constraints around, somebody has approved policy, politics, bias, values, experience have all gone into that mix. And we sh we should never let a person off the hook. There is always a human that should be accountable and responsible, um, and we should always ask that. So we should never be um, uh, tricked or duped or kind of um, a sleight of hand uh, to kind of distract us away from that. As a question around, is there any book about AI and its future? Um, and that's a question by Vasco Brace. Um, you know, I've spent um, the last two years uh, reading lots of these books. And honestly, um, my honest answer is there aren't that many that are very good um, for several reasons. So many of the good uh, books will be rooted in the academic discussions around ethics and what it means to give machines, you know, decision-making properties. There is really interesting discussions around, you know, will machines if they develop exponentially, improve exponentially, will they become, um, you know, um, sentient and uh, will there be a singularity where they kind of keep keep improving and, and no longer need us to kind of manufacture them and improve them? These are interesting uh, uh, theoretical discussions. Um, but in terms of, you know, um, good practice and safe practice around algorithms, um, there isn't that much out there because it's a new field. So my recommendation actually is um, uh, listening to people talk, um, joining in debates. Um, some of the older work around robotics um, is 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 solid because um, we didn't have this kind of the word AI to distract us. Um, so I think I, I can post a link to some some um, good books, but unfortunately a lot of the stuff um, is is either trying to take advantage of the hype or is impractical because it's very lovely but um impractical discussion around you know around the nature and philosophy of of consciousness for example um next question accountability yeah absolutely from jim you know uh, accountability is absolutely key you know so one thing to take away is don't be fooled by the hype don't let anyone distract you with displacing accountability you know somebody's responsible somebody signed off and if they if they didn't you know, if they deny responsibility that's a dereliction of their duty um <clears throat> yeah so Tam, <laughs> um yeah and maybe i mean um yeah tam's in saying that um uh, may, maybe there's a gap in the market for a book um yeah i think it's a you know it's a, everyone can contribute it's an early st you know we're at the early stages of this you know, 30 years ago in information security, we all knew there was a problem. We were all exploring different ways of dealing with it. Um, some were pushing for less regulation. Some were pushing for a more prescriptive approach to security. But over the years, we, we matured and we developed consensus, not just in terms of what to do, but importantly, clarity around what are the objectives of information security? Why are we doing this stuff anyway? And that clarity isn't quite there yet with um with with um with ai um and as soon as that kind of solidifies um that clarity will then imply the kinds of practical controls and measures that we'll take but i think we're fast approaching that um you know if you look around uh, the work that universities are doing governments are doing public bodies you know um volunt you know volunt voluntary sector is doing um, there is an amazing amount of overlap in thinking um which I think is a good thing. Um, I don't think it's groupthink. How did I get into AI? Um, I think um, <laughs> I think you know, as a as a young child, I was always interested in um, you know the the possibilities of what 
mathematics and technology could do. Um, you know, I, I, some of my other kind of um, hobbies um, is around kind of you know, trying to inspire people into mathematics, into into STEM subjects. Um, and it's amazing to see, you know, what um, what what technology and 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 logic and and mathematics uh, can do, both in terms of um, being able to do amazing things like talk to your phone, um, <laughs> diagnose diseases, play games, um, help people do what they do better. Um, but also in terms of the arts and the aesthetic and kind of um, fields, um, there's a lot of uh, interesting beauty in there. Um, so if, if anyone is interested in the you know, the artistic applications of algorithms and and, and machine learning and technology, uh, do get in touch because I, I do run um, 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 those activities. Um, my London group is um, um, uh, quite active. Um, there's four and a half thousand people who 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 are interested in the subject. Um, some people on this um, chat list um, know that we've we organized um, um, a series of events and exhibitions and performances um, in Cornwall um, at the end of last year to showcase um, the creative and, and aesthetic um, applications of, of algorithms, mathematics, AI. And it's a way of kind of bringing people into, into the field and then also getting them kind of, you know, interested in not just the fun elements, but also the serious elements. I'll post a link to that actually while I'm while I'm self-promoting. <laughs> Great. Um, are there any more questions, or or should we go and listen to some of the other talks? Okay, so um, um, we'll 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 call it a halt there. But um, you know, anyone can contact me. Um, uh, feel free to um, find me on on social media or email me or contact me via the various kind of platforms. I'm really happy to kind of have a have a chat. And if anyone works at an organisation where they think you know a little workshop or a little kind of introductory chat to to this would be helpful, um, I'm really happy to do that because um, I think the more people are aware of the issues and how to think about it, the better it is for everyone. Okay, well, enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, thanks for thanks for taking part. Cheers.